Hey, welcome to my studio practice. Uh, I'm gonna take us through, um, well, first I should introduce myself. Um, Bob Jones, I'm one of the graduate students here at Eastern. Uh, my focus is interdisciplinary, uh, but primarily my background is in sculpture. And I, well, we'll get into why I'm interdisciplinary at the moment. Uh, and, um, yeah, I'm right here working alongside uh, you all in on campus. Um, and so I'm going to share some of my, you know, in, when I was asked to, to share my studio practice, I wanted to, you know, I want to make clear up front that this has been a changing uh, practice. And so hopefully I'll have moments along the way to highlight that. Um, you know, life often gets in the way of these things and uh, your thought process change over time. Um, so we are going to start pretty much at the beginning. Uh, I was a, I was a uh, undergrad at the University of New Hampshire where I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts. This piece was sort of my quintessential uh, piece of my, my show along with many others, but this one was my my favorite. I kind of built the show around it. And I was really interested at the time uh, in time uh, and the emerging figure. I was, you know, these these uh, pieces that I was um, making at the time, they almost, they just pulled like a short amount of time. So time's going to be a recurring theme for me today uh, as it kind of travels as, as maybe my most common theme throughout my work. Um, and so these first figures, you know, is dealing with, uh, you know, almost just a, a, a few seconds, you know, or a few moments, but trying to drag that time out. And I was working with uh, clay, wax, uh, mold making practices, plaster, uh, bronze casting. Uh, I was very fascinated with the mold making specifically, being able to flip materials, uh, sculptures between materials. Um, and early on, you know, I had sort of developed this, this mold, this kind of loop with mold making where you could make something in clay, put it through a mold into another material, maybe even bronze, and then remold it and go through the process again and kind of collect, uh, um, kind of collect uh, textures and, and, and little bits of the process along the way. Uh, I was really influenced at the time um, by the kind of material uh, expression of um, these two sculptors in particular, Medardo Rosso on the left and Rodin on the right. They're kind of like almost early sculptural impressionists uh, using for maybe the first time, uh, like really pushing the materials to be expressive in themselves, to show off what the material is on its own, or what it like kind of pulling the figure out of that raw state. So that was influential. And then also um, looking at um, Giacometti on the left and Ab uh, Magdalena Abakanoets on the right uh, were some early influences. The materiality, the expressiveness, you know, were a big part of it, but also these two, you know, having to do with the Having to do with the the kind of translation of their of their time, the the they're both artists who I think are you know somehow beautifully translate the trauma of the 20th century, the early 20th century, into sculptural forms uh, in materials. And uh, there's something uh, you know there's something very important in that uh, that I try to take with me, which is you know the artist's job really is to is to try to feel uh, the time that they're in and try to somehow translate uh, and communicate that. Um, and so that's what I try to do, um, which we'll get to later. Uh, so early studio practice, we're gonna go through these uh, really quick here, but um, this, was, this was where my first studio was and I literally had to paint this building to pay for my studio in there uh, right after school. So this fabulous paint job is uh, done by yours truly. Uh, and 
Um, shortly after that, I was able to get a job uh, in as a metal fabricator. Um, I started out very ground level. Um, this is not this is work that I did, but much more recently, I started at this company super low on the totem pole, not getting paid very much. Um, but they allowed me to stay after hours, and you know, I learned how to weld there. I learned, you know, all of the things about metal and working with metal that I didn't learn in my undergrad. And uh, so just as an example of like, you know, uh, anytime that you can find a job that's gonna pay you to learn something that you think should be incorporated into your practice, that's great, take, take that opportunity. Um, a big part of my work history has been uh, filling up my tool belt with, uh, you know, techniques uh, that I can bring back to sculpture. Uh, this was the next job. I moved to San Diego, which is where I spent most of the last uh, 10 years prior to, well, in between my undergrad and my graduate um, degree. I was really excited. I had this job as a sculptor, um, but, you know, uh, you know, my job title was sculptor and I was technically sculpting. We were making these hyper-realistic trees, um, but, you know, quickly this, it, it got really old. You know, it was I don't know if it's even art. It's definitely not my art. And the, the whole point of it was that it's, you know, that it be unseen, you know, like it's, it's, it doesn't say anything. And so it's very frustrating as someone who felt like they had something to say. Um, and so luckily, um, I, at the time I was actually just, again, studio practice, trying to bring this back to process. I was working in my apartment, you know, like I, you know, whatever I needed to do to keep going. Uh, and I had scaled up at the time, started working with um, wire and concrete, um, partly because they were cheap, available materials, and then partly because, uh, you know, I was reflecting the, the, the new environment that I was in, which was the city, which is mostly built of steel and concrete. And I wanted to reflect that in the work. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, luckily... I was offered at this time, simultaneously I got, uh, uh, as I was scaling up, um, I ended up getting signed by my first gallery and got into, got a, an opportunity to do a public sculpture commission. So I quit that job that I had to take these other opportunities. Um, this is the public sculpture commission, which um, I want to show this, you know, not because I'm particularly proud of this work. I don't even necessarily really consider it my work. It was a um, I was particularly suited for this process. They asked me to do it and uh, they paid me very well to do it. So uh, it allowed me to start my own business and uh, you know quit the job that I was working on. But I include it mostly because the process of doing this large scale commission was extremely, um, again, valuable uh, just experience wise. I mean, it was uh, complicated. Uh, I had to fly to Washington, D.C., where the project is, to take measurements on this old historic wall uh, where the requirements were that I could only anchor into the mortar joints, take those measurements back to San Diego and fabricate this thing, and somehow it all worked out. Um, but there was tons of logistics involved, packing, shipping, managing a budget. Yeah, I finally got set up with a, like a legit studio um, and... Uh, um, you know, I had for the first time I was, I was outsourcing labor, but I was also my first project using CNC because I had to translate my drawings into stainless steel. And so I had to work with a company to create these DXF files for them so that they could water jet, um, a lot of these parts out. So, um, anyway, that's, uh, oh, and just one more thing about this, like, uh, you know, it's, like I was, I had almost nothing before uh, this project. I was really almost had nothing. I had a couple big wire sculptures that I had made, but I had an online presence, and I think that I that can't be kind of um, understated the the importance of that. And maybe everybody knows that now, but uh, the that's how I got this work. You know, it was like some random, you know, phone call that I got where I had been referred by some other artist that had seen my stuff online. And anyway, uh, it's, 
it sometimes just seems like you're just dumping stuff into the void of the internet, but every once in a while stuff does kick back. Um, back in my studio, uh, I worked on um, actually simultaneous with that project um, and using a lot of the leftover materials that I had from it, uh, I made this body of work called Techno Mythology, where I was really trying to stretch out the timeline uh, that I had been working with. Uh, um, you know, that really short emerging figure timeline became a kind of, you know, through this show, uh, a whole history of like, you know, uh, ancient, you know, early humans to the present day through a series of figures, um, trying to trying to flesh out that story and work my way through it. And as a part of that, as I got to the present day, I started thinking about kind of speculative futures, and I started incorporating um, some digital media, some of my early video work, some uh, found objects, um, kind of uh, mechanical stuff that I was getting from scrapyards. Um, and thinking about, you know, uh, sort of started to think about conceptually uh, the the kind of technogenic adventure with this show, the development, uh, the 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 inter um, what's how to say it the the growing together of people and technology over time, uh, something like that. And so my work at this time has really started to be about technology and maybe started to incorporate some of that, more of that, but still was mainly uh, in the same kind of steel and concrete work that I had been doing um, that was more alluding to uh, technology. Um, I also wanted to stop just briefly at this one to describe uh, a part of my practice that is ongoing, which is that I... I am, I always, you know, I keep, uh, I keep old sculptures, you know, if nothing happens with it, nobody buys it, it stops getting in shows, it's not even maybe really about what your sculpture's about anymore, hang on to that stuff, you know, and, and uh, I, I put it back, you know, it can always feed back into the process, um, and you can come back to it, just like old sketchbooks, you know, every once in a while you flip through the old sketchbook, um, and, and the really great thing about it is you can have these these materials that you worked, uh, and these sculptures, or, or uh, you know, these things that you worked on, that you're no longer precious about, and so all of a sudden you can take these wild risks that you never would have done uh, at the time when you made it, and so this was like a kind of reinterpretation of some of that early um, work out coming out of my BFA that I revisited much later. Um, another good example of that: this piece, which was part of the techno mythology series. Uh, you, nothing happened to this piece um, before I moved from San Diego to here and I couldn't bring it with me. Uh, so I took the opportunity uh, to save a part of this piece, the, my favorite part, which is the screaming chimp head, uh, and I just cut off the head. It's currently in my studio. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it and I have every intention that at some point I'm going to realize what I should do with it or what I might do with it and something interesting, probably more interesting than this original piece will happen with it. Uh, so it was like right at this time, my practice uh, started really venturing out of the studio um, to look f into the world for materials other than, you know, at the store, the material store, whatever, Home Depot, the art craft store, the metal fab store. Um, I was looking at scrap yards. I was, uh, you know, taking apart machines, you know, and just, really was a time of experimentation. Uh, I started doing these kind of fossilized, you know, this, this old hardware this, with these, you know, histories and these patinas and kind of fossilizing them into concrete. Um, and then that led me to um, my, this, I had a residency um, at Joshua Tree, uh, in Joshua Tree, California, which is right in the desert. Uh, it was called the Joshua Tree Highlands Artist Residency. If any of you are interested, it's a fantastic residency. You should absolutely check it out. Uh, and so I, what I became attracted to there, you know, I went with the intention of really getting outside of my practice. And so this is a time when my practice changed considerably. Um, but I went into the landscape and I was exploring uh, exploring the, the desert 
uh, and you know it was, it was totally alien landscape and a hostile yeah. landscape and I was really end up being attracted to these dumping sites which unlike other places in the country sit right on the surface uh, there's no foliage there's no forest to hide these things uh, they're just right out there uh, and these kind of violent marks on the landscape um, and so I just decided to react um, to these dumping sites and so presented with an alien and hostile landscape, naturally, I built myself a spacesuit. Uh, <laughs> this process was, uh, you know, I wanted to get outside of, you know, making figures and characters and actually embody a character myself. Um, and so I built this suit uh, very cheaply. You know, I tried to kind of... Uh, I don't know how it comes, you know, I don't know how it's perceived. I tried to, 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 to make it as, uh, as, you know, sort of interesting, uh, and, and sci-fi as I could on a very low, uh, budget. And so, you know, it's like a painter's suit with, you know, like juice bottles cut up for these leg pieces and just like a, a regular safety mask. And I just spray painted everything silver, but, uh, the real pieces for this were videos, um, and they have some sound quality, so we'll just watch those right now. Okay, so um, just quickly, the process behind this was, uh, you know, I'd find these dumping sites. I would get out there. I'd get my, you know, I would. Um, I had, I didn't have anybody filming these with me, uh, and so in order to create a site for interaction here and capture that interaction, I had like four cameras. I had a DSLR. I had my, you know, my iPhone camera. I had. Uh, a GoPro and then I think somebody lent me another GoPro and I would just take these and just set them up in the site and then I just forget about the can you know record everything and then I had like 20 minutes before my DSLR uh, stopped recording and I would just uh, I would just play you know I would just interact I had no idea what I was going to do going into these so I just uh, I just let myself um, I didn't know if I was going to build, you know, construct things or, or you know, uh, I didn't I had no idea what I was going to do. And so that was, um, and then after that, it was just video editing, you know, lots and lots of video editing and a steep learning curve because I hadn't really done anything like this before. Uh, so watch one more of uh, this series. The financial hardship in the U.S. Authentic, delicious barbecue. <laughs> Equations. If you break them down to the units, it 
bring you to Jesus Christ. To Jesus, Jesus Christ. But be sure to get your gift in during the month of June. Month of June. Okay, so yeah, it's interesting to go back and watch these. Um, I think uh, a couple things about uh, this process and how this evolved uh, along the way uh, was it's it's still very much about uh, time, uh, the figure blinking in and out of existence in the scene kind of came about from the these sites are so strange and you know there's clearly some actions and violent actions that have been taken on these sites. Like people have literally dumped stuff over and over again to accumulate this, but there's a sense of stillness that, that, that nothing here ever changes. And he, as much action as I could take in that scene, as many things, whatever I was doing, stacking things, breaking things, throwing them off a camper, uh, it felt as though once I was gone that it would just be right back to stillness where nothing was going to be changing again and I really you know had made no difference uh, in this in this site at all um, and then you know the there was also an overlay of a lot of kind of fundamentalist Christian radio which was something that happened just because I was listening to the radio trying to get in touch with the local culture and that's something that stood out to me um, as uh, as an interesting um, connection with these uh, with these kind of dumping sites uh, the next process um, the next uh, process I, I just wanted to say briefly like this kind of came about but because I had I had finally gotten accepted to Vermont Studio Center residency uh, which I was excited about and it fell through because you know, I didn't, I didn't get a, one of their fellowships uh, or whatever, and it was just going to be too expensive at the time. So, but I decided, you know, I said, fuck it, I'm going to make my own uh, residency. And so uh, I was visiting Vermont anyway, that's where I'm from. And I was exploring the landscape, I was responding to it in a similar way as Joshua Tree. And uh, I ended up being a kind of gravitated towards the junk in my mom's basement um and so i just had i you know uh i was very frustrated with it um and i was kind of a tr like confused about this consumerist culture and the attachment of value and the holding on to this kind of stuff um and so i decided that uh you know, I was I decided that I need to liberate uh, the stuff from the basement um, that I I needed to, to, to intervene in this process of perceived future value which never actually amounts to anything and actually um, embrace the memory of these of these things and and sort of revalue them and and put them back into the landscape as art so I think both these projects were dealing with memory and value and trash in the landscape um, in different ways I think Maybe this one I wanted to be kind of constructive in, with the trash in the landscape as opposed to the Joshua Tree kind of, you know, uh, not really building or doing anything. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, so there's one more shot of that. Um, and then the next uh, project, I'm back in my studio in San Diego. And actually this one kind of came about by seeing other artists like do video installations and kind of like leave the cords super visible like not make any effort to hide the cords and i thought you know i didn't i wasn't a, a fan of that but i but i did uh give me some inspiration to think like uh that these cords are uh these cords are super valuable like they're not, not super valuable they're they're the connection between the like the literal connection between the digital and the physical, and I wanted to explore that. So I got a bunch of these cords in my studio, and I started weaving them together. You know, very like kind of Tara Donovan style. You know, I was just pushing the materiality, the strength of these things, the copper, the plastic. They're very strong, and I just started to weave these nets, and I just wanted to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, I put together finally this show. This was like my first solo show where I had a whole gallery to myself. And it was uh, it was a combination of video and 
uh, physical installation of these nets. Uh, and yeah, I think overall I had, I ended up with like 800 pounds of, uh, of e-waste uh, devices and nets and things. Um, and I, uh, you know, the whole, the, the show was, you know, it was about the, the physical grounding of the digital space. Um, and, you know, both became immersive experiences, uh, but, um, yeah, I was paying close attention to this, uh, this physicality, um, of the wires and, and, and kind of just exploring, um, this new territory. Um, I mean, my, I was starting to look at technology as information. Uh, and the, the digital space through the screen, you know, became a new way to um, explore light and space um, because I was all of a sudden introducing kind of the, the illusory depth of the screen um, and also, you know, activating the walls with the light of these installations and things. But um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just move on. That's fine. Uh, this was one of the other video pieces in the show. Um, and this really came about from taking notes um, and experimenting. I, again, I come up with a lot of the ideas that I have outside of the studio when I'm not really specifically trying to come up with ideas. And so this tunnel effect of screens viewing screens really came about by uh, I was watching one of my friends watch a concert through her phone screen and uh, it just was so kind of interesting uh, to me that that tunnel effect um, and spoke to this uh, spoke to this um, this transition that we're in between, you know, like spending more and more time into uh, the virtual space of screens. And so I got, uh, you know, really just different sizes of uh, like plywood, uh, quarter inch plywood, and I green screened them all, you know, I put green fabric over them and I just started taking videos uh, in mundane spaces, mapped those onto the green screen screens that I, that I had, so I would be, in a mundane space, taking a video of myself walking around with the, you know, with the, the, the screen. Um, and then this, this last one with my cat here just, I mean, really just happened and, and everything fell into place. And the, the, the final frame being this cat, which was physically interacting, you know, so physically dynamic in the space, uh, really balanced the work and sort of everything kind of came together uh, with that piece. Um, there was an intermediate period here. I don't normally do a lot of drawings and I haven't shown uh, these anywhere, but I had decided to go to grad school. I had decided I needed more of these digital tools, uh, whether it be CNC or video or whatever. I needed to have access to uh, the kind of newest tools available. And when you're living in San Diego and you're realizing that you're going to move and go somewhere else to grad school, there is a very strong impulse to stop making like 300 pound sculptures. So I decided to revitalize my drawing practice. Uh, and, um, that's what I, that's what I did. Uh, it was, it was fun. I was kind of building, uh, drawings, you know, in this, uh, in a, in a cumulative way, uh, with the imagery. Um, and, you know, nothing came of it, but I was also videoing these. I thought maybe there was some animation to see the drawing growing. There's always, there's always, always stuff in the background, projects that, that, that don't see, you know, that, that, don't, that don't get showed in presentations like this. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that just, you know, dies on the vine. Uh, and so um, you really, you're just in these artists' presentations, not just mine, I'm sure other artists work this way as well, you're really just seeing this thin layer of stuff that that uh, ends up becoming something uh, worth showing. Uh, but uh, I had started early experimentations with 
uh, 3D scanning and printing. This was um, kind of going all the way back to that mold making process, but using the digital uh, space as uh, uh, the, the, the process of 3D scanning as the mold making. So I took this very physical uh, welded steel ball that you see in the middle here, and I scanned it into um, an STL file into the digital space and then reprinted it a couple times uh, and then sort of redigitized it through making this GIF out of it. Um, and overall, I think this this very simple piece was quite successful. The, the, the original object is very interesting to hold all by itself and this uh, piece somehow uh, is at least as interesting um, as that one. So I think that was a success. Um, Quickly, I just wanted to talk about some of my new inspirations. Uh, new, they're not new like contemporary. These are uh, the nouveau realists, uh, French artists from the 1960s reacting against uh, abstract expressionism, trying to bring art back into the kind of real world. Uh, and you know, especially this one on the right here, which I apologize, I forget the artist's name, but uh, the... Um, just one of my favorite pieces of all time. I mean, the, the, the ability to take these industrial, uh, the, these kind of industrial beams, these large scale, you know, the, the beam becomes, you know, it's not a tree anymore. It's a, it's, a, it's a construction material. And to take those and backwards progress them and carve out these, uh, these trees uh, to sort of reverse them into time and pull the nature back out of them is just incredible. Um, so, so that's a, a time period worth looking at. Uh, and so as I was looking at that time period, um, I was incorporating kind of that thinking a little bit into my process. And uh, this is a piece where I sort of took, uh, you know, I found this uh, typewriter in uh, just... Where did I find it? It was like a, basically a reused store. And so I took this $5 typewriter that was just like this compact, uh, this, this insanely complex, compact um, uh, machine with so much complexity and potential. Uh, and, I, and I had to take it apart. Um, and, and ultimately, I think it was kind of a, process is, uh, is, is releasing the entropy that's locked up in these objects um, and uh, and uh, I, I find that process still very interesting uh, to take products that are sort of frozen and dead and try to re-release that entropy and that uh, the, the human quality uh, and impulse to I mean like all of these parts uh, you know they, they become frozen because they're fit through this filter of, of utilitarian use uh, and, and individual purpose so tightly, you know, and somehow there's a metaphor there for me for a culture built on, on specialization as well. Uh, this was a project from last semester um, using found internet objects. Uh, I'm trying to talk about the information overload uh, and the, the kind of um, the, the kind of just overabundance of, of uh, information that we now get in the kind of age of the internet. And so I wanted to source my found objects from the internet. Um, it was new territory for me. This was all 3D printed, this middle space. Um, and it was really actually, I think, most closely related to my drawing process in that I was just, uh, I, I was just pulling together all of this imagery and in an assemblage process, uh, you know, they kind of, they build a narrative, um, but they also lose their individual identity uh, and become sort of a mass. And I, uh, I sort of um, wanted to contrast that and, and contain it sort of in this uh, very structured, very kind of um, craft-based cube that I made. Uh, it's, uh, was very difficult to construct actually and I used uh, you know some of these uh, things these craft things I'm still using digital processes I still model this uh, in the computer to try to get all of these interior angles right it actually 
didn't end up working out that well. Uh, somehow my math skills and computer software skills are limited enough that, that these interior uh, pieces connecting the two cubes together, I couldn't quite figure out the math and I ended up relying on a process of trial and error, just shaving these things down a little bit at a time until I got the perfect fit. Um, and so sometimes you gotta work with what you got. Uh, this is the other piece from last semester. It's um, it's it's uh, communicating more in a symbolic, figurative sense, uh, kind of reminiscent of some of my earlier work, I would say. Um, but it incorporates more processes, right? It incorporates uh, a wider range of kind of brutalist uh, wood carving and steel work all the way to, uh, you know, laser cutter um, and 3D printer um, and industrial objects along the way. Um, even though uh, just process-wise, uh, this water tower underneath, even though I didn't uh, CNC that or anything, I did model it in software first uh, to get the dimensions of each one of these rings, uh, which was extremely useful. Um, but this, you know, my process for this piece actually started really with actually just two of these found objects. Uh, this collar around the figure's neck here uh, was an interesting found object, uh, a, a wood form from an old factory in Buffalo, and this uh, Life jacket was actually from that project way back in my mom's basement that I had held on to because I have some, you know, certain objects uh, they don't belong in big assemblages, but they have uh, they're they're powerful enough that you know you have to kind of do something with them. And I felt that these were that, and so just those two objects ended up basically kicking around in my sketchbook for a while, um, and. Uh, just were the seed for this idea. And I think so often that's something that involves in my process. It's working on multiple things at a time and just planting these little seeds. Um, and you just never know what one is gonna, is gonna kind of grow into something. Um, and so my process now, uh, you know, this is the work that I'm doing right now in my studio. None of these are finished. They're all have already or are going to change. Uh, and my process now is really of, you know, aggregating not only found objects, but uh, little pieces that I craft myself, natural materials, uh, just a whole spectrum of things that we would call objects, uh, technical artifacts, uh, etc. And creating a creative fiction, just putting these things in contact with each other and exploring just with an iterative combination, you know, process of just um, kind of mashing these things up and figuring out what is communicating with what. Uh, and, you know, one of the interesting parts about this process, a lot, lot of it I could have done, you know, years ago, technically, um, but I am incorporating the digital uh, as a means to further explore these objects sometimes, and you can't necessarily see it in these pieces, but, um, I'll be filtering something through uh, the computer, through the digital process by scanning and reprinting. And other times um, I'm using objects that I found online and printing them, casting them in aluminum, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's, an, it's in some ways the digital processes that, that you have access to here at the university are just another tool, you know? Uh, like they're just simply another way to filter these things uh, or another way to, to, to figure out and plan in space. Um, it, kind of like mold making is a tool uh, to filter um, these objects. Um, and, in, and in another sense, they're, they're so contemporary in the light of like uh, just the cultural context that they really supply uh, a potency to the conversation of of uh, the growth of technology and, and, and the speculation as to where it might be going, that they also, you know, I, I use them also to interject that uh, kind of a storyline in. Uh, and so this is just some more uh, works in progress. These are in my studio now. I'm working through this process. And um, this is the last slide. Uh, thanks for making it this far. Uh, if this was really interesting to you, uh, I want to you know, give you all an open invitation. I mean, I'm right there on campus whenever we get back. I've got a whole nother year. 
So if you're around and you're interested in furthering this conversation or just taking a look into the studio to see what all this chaos looks like or where I go with it, you know, I'd love to have you come by uh, and have a conversation. My studio's in the basement in Ford and uh, it's down the elevator straight out the door. Uh, probably send me an email first. I should have uh, included my contact at the end of this, but uh, alas, I did not. So, but I'm sure you can get, you know, you can get the information. If, if you don't know me or you don't run into me, uh, you can get my email from uh, one of the faculty for sure. Uh, and so good luck on your projects. Good luck with the, uh, the, uh, everybody's new reality for the moment. And, uh, and, um, yeah, thanks for watching. All right, great. Bye.